Well, we will go ahead and get started. I am Brooks Barrett. I am the Environmental Justice Minister for the United Church of Christ. Excited to be coming to you with this month's installment of the Creation Justice webinar with my co-host, Michael Malcolm. Michael, those of you who don't know him, he, uh, he wears more hats than I can count. Uh, it's like a walk-in closet full of hats. He's the, the senior pastor of Rush Memorial Congregational UCC in Atlanta. He is the executive director for Alabama Interfaith Power and Light, uh, the executive director for the People's Justice Council, and, and I'm just getting started on the, that's the short list of, of, his, of his hats. So great to have you on here, Michael. The plan for today is that Michael is going to give us some theological framing for our conversation today, and then we will hear from, from a very special guest, Nick Nessus, as he presents to us about Standing Rock and the long tradition of indigenous resistance. At the end, we'll have time for questions and comments. Um, and as you'll note, there's also a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, at any point, you're welcome to put a question there, uh, and we will seek to address those questions later on, uh, either by typing responses or responding to them verbally. So with that said, Michael, I turn things over to you to, to give us a feel for our, for our conversation today. Yeah, thank you, Brooks. Uh, thank you all for being with us. Um, in, in light of our guest today and, uh, and, and true affection for, where, for his position as, as well as um, kinship with his position, I talked to you all about um, allowing for uh, leadership to, to take place from the grassroots up. Uh, Barack Obama said the best education I received was working with people in the community on a grassroots basis because what it taught me was that ordinary people when they work when they are working together can do extraordinary things um, I believe that Jesus may have said it something like this the last will be first and the first will be last uh, there's an unknown tribe that, that um, has a quote that I found that I'd like to share with you all. It says, treat the earth well. It was not given to you by your parents. It was loaned to you by your children. We do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. That is the best perspective that I've seen on inheritance when it comes down uh, to how we should leave or view the earth. Uh, this particular inheritance or the way that we should view the earth uh, should be done in regards to a bottom-up approach. And the way that we should um, look at keeping the earth should be from a bottom-up approach. And our um, indigenous brothers and sisters, our uh, First Nation, uh, are keepers of the earth, have been keepers of the earth from past until now. And I think it's time that we start taking a listen from those that we have actually put last, because the last should be first, and the first should be last. Thank you, and I look forward to hearing from Brother Nick Estes. All right, thank you, Michael, for that framing for today. And now I am delighted to present to you, to all of you, uh, Nick Estes. I first learned about Nick back in March uh, when he was interviewed by Amy Goodman on Democracy Now. Uh, then got the uh, the audio book version of our history is the future standing rock versus the dakota access pipeline and the long tradition of indigenous resistance uh, i'm the kind of person that likes to hear a sermon rather than read a sermon so that's i, I got i've been listening to it uh they take the train into work and so it's been terrific and it's continuing to impact me uh, in multiple ways, and I'm delighted now to, to present Nick to all of you so that all of you can be uh, impacted as well uh, by his incredible work and perspective that he's bringing to us. And so, Nick, I thank you for what you've done. I think it, it goes without saying anybody who has read a little bit of your uh, bio that you are 
more than a, a scholar of the struggle for liberation, but you are someone who is deeply engaged in the struggle for liberation. And so uh, it is a tremendous honor to have you here with us today, and we will let you uh, take things over. Uh, um, let's just say a, a greeting in the Lakota language, um, which actually translates, you know, hello, my relatives. I, I greet each and one of you with an open hand or with a handshake and an open heart. And I just want to thank both uh, Brooks and Michael for inviting me on to this um, webinar. Um, and to be honest, um, as, as the book tour has progressed, um, I have spent more time in churches than I have in the last two decades of my life. <laughs> Um, I'm not. Um, I'm not somebody who uh, goes to church regularly. I was raised in an Episcopalian home, but um, I practice, you know, our our traditions and try to keep them as live uh, as much alive as possible. And my my grandfather, who I'll be speaking about shortly, was actually a minister within the church, and it was through the church, um, the Episcopal Church, that our languages stayed alive, um, our Lakota language stayed alive, but also. It was how we could mobilize politically because we couldn't organize openly for the longest time. And so very much like the civil rights movement, a lot of the movements against um, the termination legislation that we successfully defeated in the, in the 50s and the 60s uh, began with the, the, the church and the clergy. And um, I just wanted to give that little shout out because it's not a well-known history. Um, so I'm going to do a screen share and, and share some slides with you um, just to kind of give some background about myself, but also the book. So just bear with me. Um, let's see if this works. Um, okay. Can you all see the slides? Okay. Yep, looks good. Okay, so I will just start. Um, this is the cover of the book, obviously. Um, it's, a, it's a picture. I want to just talk a little bit about this because I think it frames the book itself. This is a picture of um, the Crow Creek writers. Um, they're a group of young um, high school age, uh, primarily young men um, who were invited by the chairman of the, the, the Crow Creek Sioux tribe to actually be a part of the Standing Rock movement itself. And um, as I was kind of negotiating about a book cover, um, a lot of the covers that were proposed had um, images of like the more spectacular kind of forms of police violence. And I really didn't feel like that captured the movement that I saw because it was young, it was a young movement and it was one that was very positive. And I think the, the level of police violence um, that was inflicted on water protectors tends to overshadow um, what the movement itself is about. Um, and the, the next picture I'm showing here is, um, oh, and I guess my, my, re my really good friend, Michelle Latimer, took that, that photo that made it onto the cover of the book. Um, the next picture that I'm showing here is just kind of a, a map to kind of put you into um, the context of the Ocheti Shakoi territory, the Ocheti Shakoi Makoche, as we call it. Um, and Ocheti Shakoi means the nation of the seven council fires. Ocheti means fire, Shakoi means seven. Um, and unfortunately, this map is a little bit limited because out in Minnesota, that's actually our eastern boundary. But this is more so um, showing the political and legal territory um, through which these, these pipelines trespass. So in the northern part, you can see um, where my cursor is. You can see the Dakota Access Pipeline cuts through um, not only the 1851 treaty territory, but um, unceded territory of the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty. And um, there's another map, but I don't have it here, but it actually shows how um, the, the, the pipeline was originally meant to go north of or upriver from Bismarck, which is a white dominated town, but then was rerouted through um, the northern tip of, of the Standing Rock Reservation. So technically the pipeline itself doesn't cross reservation lands, but it does cross treaty territory. And so that's why it's contested. Um, and the number six is that you can see here on this map are actually our current territorial boundaries. So we went from this, which is about um, 70 million acres of territory, about the size of, of the state of um, Nevada, um, down to this, this diminished territory. And I don't really know the acreage, but it's very small. And you can also see um, on this map, which is on the inset at the beginning of the book, um, the, the strategic placement of 
these five earthen rolled dams, um, beginning with the, the southernmost dam, Gavin's Point, Fort Randall, oops, um, Fort Randall, Big Bend, um, Oahe Dam, and then Garrison Dam, they are all downriver of, of Indian reservations. Um, and so these dams were built as part of the 1944 Flood Control Act. But I just wanted to give you all a visual of what it looks like. And so to kind of um, put this into a contemporary context, the current um, Keystone XL pipeline cuts through the heart of the western half of, of South Dakota, which is actually um, considered our permanent reservation homelands um, for, the, for the Great Sioux Nation. So the, the, the current Keystone XL pipeline is, like, is, is going to affect and is drawing into conflict um, the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. Um, the Lower Brule uh, Sioux Tribe, where I'm from, the Rosebud Reservation, the Rosebud Sioux Tribe, and as well as the Pine Ridge um, Reservation and Yankton, because it goes down the south, um, south, but also the Fort Peck um, Reservation. And then further south, um, you have Ponca and Winnebago as well. So this picture, I think, um, really captures um, the historical context of Standing Rock itself. This was taken. Um, by Lindsay um, Norton on the day, on, on October 27th, um, 2016. It was the day of the more um, violent police raid against one of the treaty camps. Um, and I, I detail the, the kind of context of that raid in the book, but I think this picture itself is, um, speaks volumes. Um, I, 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 came, I wasn't there the day of the raid, but I was there, I was there afterwards. And this is um, Rochelle Bullhead. She's an elder from Standing Rock. But, What's interesting about this is we, we see, you know, it's a, it's a very striking image. You have the police behind her um, and she's dressed in her traditional regalia, but what's not really known is that um, on, her, on her dress, she's wearing um, copper pennies and they have red ribbon threaded through um, the ears of Lincoln. And they, they, so they drill a hole in Lincoln's ears and they thread the, the red ribbon through. And I'd always seen this, but I had never known what it meant. And there were several, it was several days after the raid um, when it was decided to burn, um, ceremonially burn the, the remnants of the raided treaty camp, which included like TP um, canvases, um, tents, ceremonial items that were confiscated because the private security and, um, and the police, well, the police had returned the camp's remnants to us um, with all these ceremonial items and they were covered in, they were soaked in urine somebody had urinated on all the items after they were returned. And it wasn't just like a small heap. This is like um, the items for several hundred people. And so there was a large trash heap that was put into um, Ocheti Shakoi camp, the largest of several camps. And they had, you know, it's, it just, the, it smelled of urine. And this um, elder like gathered several of us um, near our camp and kind of told the story about the penny dressed and, and how um, in 1862, during the Civil War, and during the um, U.S.-Dakota um, War, the uprising, the Dakota uh, waged against the United States uh, for imposing starvation conditions on our people. Um, you know, the, the result of that was the, the sentencing of around 300 Dakota um, men specifically um, to death. And Lincoln ended up communicating the sentences of most of them except for 38. And they were hanged in... Um, Mankato, Minnesota, and Force March from Fort Snelling in, in um, the day after Christmas. And so they're hanged in, in, on December 26, um, 1862, the same week that the, um, that Obama, or not Obama, sorry, the Abraham Lincoln had signed um, the Emancipation Proclamation. And um, months later after that, um, the Lincoln had ordered a, a punitive campaign, an expedition against our people, which resulted in the massacre of about 400 people who had nothing to do with the uprising that took place in Minnesota. But that happened in 1863, and Rochelle Bullhead was actually a descendant of um, the survivors of that genocidal war. And she talked about how the reason why she, they wear the penny dress, and um, it's to remind um, Abraham Lincoln, who didn't listen to us, and when he was alive, but it, maybe he'll hear us in the afterlife, um, that we are human beings. And, and in this context, it was um, President Obama, Kyle Kirchmeyer, the sheriff of Morton County, sheriff, uh, the sheriff of Morton County, um, and the governor of the state, um, 
uh, I'm blanking on Jack Dalrymple who, who didn't listen. And so this was a reminder, um, you know, it was like a reminder that this history is very much alive and um, present with us to this day. Um, and as, as she was dancing, um, it was really surreal. This is a picture of the floodlights um, that were kind of blaring down on us um, after she finished telling this really um, tragic story. And a lot of us, you know, I mean, it, a lot of us began to cry, um, but it wasn't, she reminded us, you know, it wasn't, these aren't tears of, um, mourning their tears of liberation and when people cry in our culture it's it's they say that the ancestors are speaking through us um, and she's you know she reminded us that like we've survived genocide after genocide and we will survive this this genocide and I think this picture um, enca encapsulates um, kind of the experience of that um, because even at night there was this intense level of surveillance and militarization. And the only time I've ever experienced that outside the context of Standing Rock was when I visited Palestine. Um, and one thing that I, I noticed about a lot of the people who would come to our homelands is they they, they would comment on the, the the sort of natural beauty of um, our homelands. And you know, it is a very a very beautiful place. But somebody who has grown up there, um, who was born and raised along the river, and who grew up with the river. Um, and knowing the stories of the river, um, to me, it is it is a beautiful place, but it's it's also a place of um, immense amount of tragedy that preceded the Dakota Access Pipeline. And this is a picture of the Missouri River. This is actually a picture of my grandma um, Shawala, or my grandma Cornelia Shawala's um, allotment, which is currently underwater. And so this is actually um, not a natural um, the natural state of our river. It's actually um, an altered state. This is a a result of the damming. The river was never a, a mile across as it is in this picture. Um, but I think the, the story that I, I really want to foreground in my work is not a story of just of, of tragedy, but a story of um, resistance and a story of, um, you know, deep ancestral knowledge combined with um, kind of the prophecy of, of a better life. And this is a picture of um, a place that was once called Harney's Peak or Harney 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 Peak, um, which we call Hiankaga Paha, or which has been recently renamed Black Elk Peak. And Harney um, was a, a a a lieutenant who we called Woman Killer because he massacred um, women in an encampment. And so we used to joke that this was once called Woman, woman Killer's Peak, but it was renamed for Black Elk, who, as many of you may be familiar, had his vision um, of a coming indigenous future um, here at this the sacred site and for us it's for us it's the closest that we can get to um, god or creator because it's the highest point between the appalachian mountains and the rocky mountains and it's in, centrally located within the black hills and then within the heart of our territory um, and to this day we don't have unrestricted access to it it's mediated by state park agencies we were just there last week and they harass us every time we go up but nonetheless we make our annual pilgrimage um, to this this um, this sacred site, and um, Black Elk himself, you know, has been mischaracterized as somebody who believed in in the kind of death of our our nation, and he's been um, misquoted and and mis um, uh, misattributed to saying certain things, such as our nation's hoop is broken or um, you know, that we were just kind of essentially fading into the past, but he never said those things and nor did he ever believe those things. And actually what he believed in the actual recordings or the actual transcriptions of the interviews that he had with poet John, John Neidhart, um, who wrote um, Black Elk Speak, actually suggests that he didn't view um, like the Wounded Knee Massacre as the end of the resistance or the end of the ghost dance. But in fact, he says something along the lines that the tree of you know the tree of life um, has strong roots in the ground, and it will it will bloom once again. And that it's our job as Lakota people, um, and as, and as indigenous people, to ensure that the tree of life continually blooms over and over again. And I think if if you know since you know the Bindaloria has called Black Elk speaks like the the kind of like North American Bible of all tribes. Um, I think if that translation had made it into um, that popular text. That we would have a different understanding of um, of prophecy and what you know what Nicholas Black Elk actually believed, and he believed in the continual renewal of life um, after Wounded Knee and after genocide and after tragedy. You know these things weren't 
just kind of like truncated for us. But he, you know, he continued on. He lived a full life himself, you know, a, a Catholic in many respects. But this picture right here is a, a photo from a friend of mine, Yadika Fields, um, who, who um, took a picture of the Veterans March that happened uh, on December 4th, um, 2016. Um, it was around the time that Obama had um, rejected the EIS, the Environmental Impact Statement, and required the code access um, to essentially refile. Um, so it was a delay, and it was a very, it was a temporary victory. But nonetheless, I think this in itself um, demonstrates the impact, not just for indigenous people, but for um, non-native people as well. Around 5,000 um, veterans came to essentially stand with water protectors. And it says something when the institution of, you know, that has committed horrific crimes against our people um, and committed acts of genocide, not just against uh, the Lakota people, but also against our non-human kin, such as the Buffalo Nations, actually refused to stand against us anymore and actually um, chose to stand with us. I think that was a very pivotal moment um, and to suggest that this, like when we say indigenous decolonization or when we say decolonization, it includes everybody. It's not just an Indian problem. Um, and this picture is also interesting too, because it's a, it's a, it reflects like we see these black and white photographs typically of native people, um, especially like massacres. And this one is like, you know, um, kind of in, it like has that, that feeling, that same kind of affective feeling, but it's one of life and it's a movement of life of what, what happens when we, you know, when we stand with each other against these injustices. And the, the next thing I want to turn to is just to kind of ground, um, our, our kind of epistemology and our belief system within, within the context of, of this, of our, our, our longer history. And this is actually our oldest um, winter count um, pictograph that exists um, currently, or at least that I know of. And it's actually, um, it says it takes place in the first year of the, of the ninth century or the, the 10th century. And um, I don't know how accurate that is, um, but this is from Brown Hat's um, Winter Count, and it actually sh um, shows the arrival of, of Tace Gawi, um, the white buffalo calf woman, who um, essentially made us Lakota people, who brought us back into correct relations with the human as well as the non-human world. And you can see to the right of the camp circle, there's a list of all the different animal nations um, that she brought us back into relationships, such as the buffalo, the elk, the deer, the antelope, beaver, um, et cetera as well as within the camp circle itself. Um, it's, she's depicted um, as, a, as a white buffalo um, and from her udders are actually falling um, corn kernels into water. And then above her, there's, um, there's a corn stalk and a, um, an elm tree, or a, a corn stalk, an elm tree, and um, a, a yucca plant. So it demonstrates our kind of like relationship with not just um, animal life, but plant life as well. And um, she was the, the first person to bring us, um, to make our, our first treaty, essentially. And um, ever since then, every time we've signed a treaty um, with the United States, um, it's under this impression, uh, under, under the auspices of this original covenant that we made with um, De Skawi. Um, and the reason why I bring that up is because typically there's a distorted view of us as Lakota people. Um, and first and foremost as like being primarily male dominated. If you just Google images of Lakota people, you'll often get um, kind of tin type black and white photographs of like the men of the 19th century, our great leaders, such as like or a, a red, red cloud and gall, et cetera. But because it was a, a male dominated view, um, you know, cast onto us and how they viewed our history. We've also internalized that history as well. Um, and this picture is just a picture of, of the warrior women um, that I grew up knowing. Um, on the left is um, uh, Don Decora. Um, it's the daughter of Madonna Thunderhawk and the sister of Marcella Gilbert, who's on the right hand side. And then central, centrally located is, or the one in the blue, um, the light blue um, um, shirt is um, Phyllis Young, who was actually a tribal. Um, councilwoman for many years. She was also an American Indian movement um, activist and was foundational to this movement um, prior to, you know, even prior to um, 2016. 
and I quote her at length in the book, and you can read um, the things that she says, but she related, she relates it to this ongoing tradition of being a water protector. And of course, Madonna Thunderhawk and Marcella have a film about them. If you want to go check it out, it's called Warrior Women. It's, it's um, airing on PBS right now, but I highly recommend it. It gives such a counter narrative to the Red Power movement if you're interested in it. Um, the other thing that I think is incredibly important is somebody like Madonna Thunderhawk founded um, what we what we now know, or what we what were called uh, survival schools, um, which are essentially alternative education programs for young Native people during the Red Power movement to essentially pull them out of these very racist um, and discriminatory set settings of public schools that many Native families, you know, found themselves in because they were relocated off the reservation, and that very much continued um, at Standing Rock. And this is just a picture of the Defenders of the Water School which was an alternative education program for young water protectors carrying on that tradition. So this is a generational thing. And I think we think of protest as like the kind of like loud um, moments of, of spectacle and, you know, clashing with police violence. And we forget that it's what sustains movements um, through time is the, the, the building of institutions. And I would say like indigenous institutions themselves, such as survival schools were foundational to passing on, you know, um, this knowledge from generation to generation. Also, you know, it was like the 10th largest city in, in, in um, North Dakota at the time. So you had to do something with the kids, right? You had to send them to school. Um, the other thing that I think was really important for me uh, personally, um, that I didn't see a lot of kind of um, recognition of was the, the recognition of um, two-spirit um, people. Um, people that um, follow along the LGBTQ spectrum uh, because they are so um, they are so uh, marginalized um, within um, our communities. And you know, when the patriarchs came, they left patriarchs when they left. You know, um, and we've internalized a lot of the um, anti-gay um, um, sentiment, um, the anti-trans, anti-two-spirit sentiment within our own communities. And for me, this was like a huge homecoming for a lot of folks and our relatives to get recognized. And they weren't just part of the camps, but they were leading a lot of the direct actions and the prayers and um, really upsetting this kind of normative understanding of you know binary gender roles or just kind of like male dominated um, spaces. And actually one of our, one of our comrades, Jaden, she's on the right hand side, she's part of our organization. She's wearing our t-shirt, the Red Nation. So <laughs> um, she's, she, was, she was part of it as well. Um, and this is them, this is the Two-Spirit Camp um, at the front lines with the police. Um, they led an action um, that day. And I just, I thought it was just a really great um, photo. Um, this is a, this is just kind of like a bird's eye or a, a, a view from the top of like one, um, a, a camp, I think it was in August when I was there. And the first thing I did was, you know, I just started creating um, a shelter, a cook shack and that cook shack actually survived the Northern Plains winter, as well as, um, you know, feeding thousands of people. But the people that, you know, I was like um, working with were, you know, there was this like Palestinian network administrator who had been yanked and who like came up, he just heard, he just kind of dropped everything and came up. And we started digging compost holes and we built this, this cook shack and uh, alongside of like, um, you know, friends of mine, such as like Josh Swagger, who was like a, a line cook and, you know, Bismarck, North Dakota. And so it was really just people like everyday folks. And of course, this is a picture of Dennis Banks, who was one of the, the co-founders of the American Indian movement. Um, he was there as well. Um, these are some of the, the folks um, from left to right. It's um, Cooney Dog, who was, has run AIM security or uh, American Indian movement security for as long as I've been alive and probably going back to the 60s or 70s. Um, and to his right, or to our right, um, next to him is um, Dave Archambault Sr., who is actually the Dave Archambault um, uh, the second's father who invited the American Indian Movement to Standing Rock in 1974 to essentially um, take our treaty claims um, to the, the world court. And it was, it was foundational in actually um, creating the document that we now know as the United Nations Declarations on our Declaration on, on the Rights of Indigenous People, which was um, passed by the UN in 2007, and then to his and to, to the far right is um, Bill Means, who is one of you know he was uh, 
Russell Means' brother, but he was also kind of brains behind a lot of this, um, this work. And so it was just cool to kind of see this, this generational stuff. Um, I'm just, these are just some photos um, of what it was like um, kind of on a daily basis of being there. Um, it was very militarized. There's a lot of things that happened that I don't think people realize um, happened. This, is, um, this was a, a common practice called hooding. Uh, where they'd put hoods on, on water protectors after they arrested them. Um, and yeah, and so that kind of gives you an idea of like what happened at camp. And there was mu as much as there was the action, the direct actions happening, there was this kind of like community building that was happening as well. And I want to turn to my own family's history really quick um, before um, I continue on. And this is a picture of the Big Bend Dam. It flooded our lands um, in 1963 when it was built. It actually relocated us for the second time. The first dam, the Fort Randall Dam, relocated us for the first time. And as a result of these two dams, um, the first one relocated one third of our population and the second one relocated um, or displaced um, a half of our population. Um, and actually the dam was supposed to be built upriver from us and we didn't know until like months before they started constructing it that they were going to remove uh, put it down river from us and we had already been you know faced relocation and started rebuilding our, our community by the time they started construction to flood it again um and it was originally supposed to go upstream but it, it was rerouted or it was um it was removed down further downstream to save the white dominated state capital of, of pierce south dakota much like the Army Corps of Engineers re rerouted the Dakota Access Pipeline to um, not contaminate the water of, of Bismarck, North Dakota. And this is a picture of my, um, my grandfather's. Um, the tallest one is Andrew um, Estes. Um, he was, you know, my paternal, my biological grandfather. He was a Lakota code talker. He fought in World War II. And when he returned home, he came to find his lands, you know, essentially um, targeted by the same military that he fought for because um, the Army Corps of Engineers is a branch of the military. Most people don't know that, um, even though it's a quote unquote civilian branch, whatever that means. Um, and so this is the original lower town site um, prior to Big Bend. And you can see the trees um, that exist in the river bottoms. These were lush river bottoms. And um, as a result of the, the construction of the dams, um, it destroyed 75% of our wildlife, which included wild, um, wild plant life, um, such as plums, choke cherries, buffalo berries, et cetera, as well as destroying 90% of our commercial timber. And I don't know how much agricultural lands were, were lost um, off the top of my head, but it was quite a bit. And so if you see this picture, this is the picture as the floodwaters were coming through. And that island that existed up here has those trees that are just being flooded. And the Army Corps essentially said, we paid you for those trees. Don't go cut them down. And they prevented us from actually cutting down the trees. They're, they basically said they're ours to waste. As a result of the flooding, um, they, we, became, we were once subsistence um, economy and kind of like um, subsidized our, our, um, our caloric intake with a lot of the so-called free goods of nature. Um, and as a result, um, they introduced um, white flour, white sugar, um, you know, milk into our diets. And you, you had a, a, I think it was like a 95% increase in diabetes. Um, and of that generation, half the people um, acquired diabetes, um, which prior to that, diabetes was entirely unknown to, to our reservation community. So it had that health impact as well as that kind of psychological impact of facing relocation, ha having your entire lands your bottom lands destroyed. Um, and my grandfather, you know, he was a water protector at this time. He fought the construction of these dams and he's pictured in the center. He's the tallest one. Um, this is the old tribal council buildings, like literally right before they flooded them. Um, and this picture I think is interesting as well because, you know, they, there's this image of us as like these, you know, these native people who ride bareback and just hunt buffalo and just are nomadic but we were actually farmers and we had a sense of agriculture and this proves that you know during this reservation period most of us had um, community agriculture but when we were relocated up um, further up um, up into the the the, um, the hills the soil the topsoil was really bad and so we couldn't reproduce our lifestyles that we that we had in the river bottoms up river or in the higher elevation because the soil was bad and so 
it wasn't that we didn't try to try to redo it. It was just that we, we didn't have the, the quality land to redo it. And this is just a picture of, you know, the many roads on our reservation that currently lead to nowhere into the water. And so I told this family history in Chicago during the, the protests and um, that was actually organized in Chicago, um, co-organized by the, the Chicago Indian Center as well as movements such as uh, Black Lives Matter. And, you know, my, my grandparents couldn't have imagined that this, you know, millions of people would have rallied to defend our river um, because at the time that the, the, da the dams were being constructed, there was nobody, there's no public opposition to the construction of the dams or the sacrifice of our people and our lands. And so in that sense, it's very meaningful, but also it's, it's generational because they were water protectors before, before I was and before many of us were. Um, I want to turn to, um, just to kind of wrap up, um, that like what this movement represented and like what's, what's happening now. And so this is a picture of a hand-drawn map that was um, given to uh, people who were attending the camp. And I, I think it really demonstrates the, the kind of values that the, the camps themselves were trying to put forward in the movement itself. And um, you notice that there's, um, these are kind of named after the different roads of uh, different um, native nations, as well as um, revolutionary heroes within our own tradition, but also in the key below, there's um, host kitchens, first aid and security. Host kitchens, where to get free food. Um, first aid, where to get free healthcare. There's also um, a uh, um, uh, the legal tent, which is up here, um, free legal aid, you know, so, and then also security, which who weren't armed, but they were, you know, charged with kind of like keeping out, out the um, out drugs and alcohol. Um, but given like the opportunity to reconstruct our own, um, you know, communities based on our own traditions, you know, we prioritize need first, which is healthcare, um, food, quality food. It wasn't just like, you know, eating out of a can, it was quality, healthy food for us, as well as um, education with the, 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 the defenders of the water school, um, as well as um, free legal aid and, you know, more poor communities in the United States don't have access to those things. And there isn't any reference to the, the militarization that was happening all around us, right? And so outside of this world that we were trying to create and live in, there is this, you know, the armed bodies of the state essentially trying to crush it. Um, this kind of gives you an idea of, there was this uh, post that kind of give you, gave you an idea of all the different places that people had come from. And I just put this in on here because Albuquerque is here, <laughs> 505. Um, the other thing that was really funny is that they would, the, 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 the police would constantly issue these um, public or these social media posts to demonize and criminalize the water protectors. And this one says 359 out-of-state agitators arrested in North Dakota. And when we saw this, we we're like, oh, yeah, that's really cool. Look at all the solidarity we've got from all over <laughs> the country. <laughs> and so and my argument would be like, this is, a representative of the infrastructures of native resistance um, that, you know, um, at the time, you know, it was like Trump was just elected in November, you know, November 8th, um, 2016. And this was the only thing that was like going on that was a resistance camp. And people were so disillusioned by the elections that, you know, the, the, the camps just surged with, with numbers, um, which is good, you know, and we welcome the solidarity and support. And I contrast that image of, of infrastructure um, with this image, which is um, the, the pipelines that are proposed to be built um, or that are currently built. And um, this is where the Dakota Access Pipeline is, is, is built. Um, and this is where the Keystone XL Pipeline is proposed to be built. And what you can see is you have the Alberta oil sands up in the north um, and the Bakken oil region um, down in the south. And the Alberta tar sands is essentially um, one of the, it's like the size of Florida, the, the landmass, and it's created this dead zone. But you have all of these pipelines emanating from there. So if Dakota Access Pipeline is the black snake, as we call it, then um, the Alberta tar sands is the is the snake pit where a lot of these things are coming, and they're drawing into um, all these different movements. Um, you can see that you know Dakota Access Pipeline um, goes through. Uh, uh, Illinois then cuts down into Louisiana and it, the, the latter leg of the pipeline was fought. Um, it, it was called the Bayou Bridge fight. Um, and that just kind of wrapped up recently as well. 
but nonetheless, like each along along the way, it's kind of drawing together these kind of um, these different communities and bringing us into a different kind of struggle. Um, these are just pictures from one of the communities in Houston um, near the oil refineries. It's a primarily um, Latino uh, community, um, but I had a chance to visit there as part of the quote unquote toxic tour, and um, it was actually really disturbing. I mean, it was um, you couldn't actually breathe and. Um, a way to cover it up is that the oil industry invested in all these like parks for children, but it's like actually hazardous for children to be out there and playing in them. So there's no children playing in these parks. Um, but this is the this is the future that I think is on offer right now. Um, if we don't do something about climate change, um, it's not just about Indians, you know, taking up the resistance. But this is everybody's this is everybody's problem and. After Standing Rock, we didn't just stop fighting. This is a picture of another reunification that we had, a treaty council meeting that we had last summer um, at the base of one of our sacred sites in the Black Hills. Um, and this is one of a picture of a treaty camp or um, a resistance camp that has been ongoing um, prior to the Dakota Access that we formed in our own reservation um, to resist um, Keystone XL and that we will continue to resist. Um, you know, that was formed in like 2013 and it still exists today. And it's brought into conversation kind of different elements of our community um, to really discuss not just, uh, we're not really like just about stopping oil pipelines, right? We actually stand for something um, that's more than just um, about um, stopping oil um, pipelines. We're, we're doing cultural programs, we're doing um, programs with youth, we're doing things um, that actually build community and not just um, are about protest, even though that's an, a, you know, it's an extent, existential requirement for us if we're gonna have clean drinking water for the future to fight these oil pipelines. And right now um, we are battling um, uh, court cases or um, legislation in, in the state of South Dakota that actually criminalizes being a water protector, that actually um, makes it a felony in the state um, to, to protest quote unquote criti critical infrastructure bills. And that's happening across the board, whether it's in Louisiana, Texas, um, you know, they implemented anti-protest laws following a lot of the the large rebellions led by um, Black Lives Matter, and they're they're implementing protest laws um, following uh, the uprising at Standing Rock. Um, but we are fighting back. I mean, the the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation banned the governor of South Dakota from entering our reservation lands because she refused to consult with um, our tribes prior to the passing of that legislation that she introduced that was actually drafted by. Um, TC Energy, formerly known as Trans Canada Energy, the constructors of, or the builders of the Keystone XL pipeline. So, um, I was I was actually on a phone call prior to this this talk about how do we combat this legislation, not just at a state level, um, in a tribal level, but how do we combat it at a at a federal level? Because the oil industry has used and weaponized um, the quote unquote tools of democracy against us. Um, and pushing for this, the, these kinds of infrastructure bills. And so I implore everybody um, who's involved in you know, um, social justice organizing or who wants to get involved or can't be involved, but they, they can offer financial assistance or resources or just educate folks to really look into these things. Um, ALEC um, is, is something that we're working on right now. I can't remember what the acronym stands for, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but we're rolling out a campaign in, within the next couple of weeks to 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 combat ALEC, um, which is promoting all, all of these these anti-protest laws. But also, if you we're hosting locally um, a new campaign called the Red Deal, which is an indigenous environmental policy that's not contrary to the, the Green New Deal, but is we see as kind of building an indigenous platform from the ground up. Um, and we were having our first rollout session here in Albuquerque in two thousand on on Wednesday, but then it's going to align with protesting and calling for a moratorium on fracking in our own um, state here in New Mexico on on Thursday, which is going to be organized with the youth run up to Santa Fe, which is the um, the roundhouse. Um, so if you want to support those efforts, um, we are a volunteer um, organization. We don't get um, big grants or foundation money, so. It's the rednation.org. Uh, if you want to check it out, um, please do. Um, everything helps. So um, I just want to thank you all for taking the time to listen. This photograph, um, this last photograph, is a picture of um, some high school students that I worked with in 2011. Many of them uh, became leaders in the Standing Rock movement itself. And 
this isn't a movement about death and like getting beat up by cops. It's actually a movement for life. And I just want folks to remember that these are real people and that indigenous people are on the front lines of these things. We're political by um, default because we're always in the way of development. And um, that the, you know, the targeted assassinations of, of indigenous environmental act activists has been noted by the United Nations. And it's also been noted by the United Nations that these um, these laws to criminalize indigenous people or what they call as protesters um, is is across the board. It's not just happening in the United States. The U.S. is leading a lot of it, but it's not it's not just happening in the United States. It's something we experience globally. So, um, yeah, thank you very much for listening. And I guess we'll turn it over to some questions. Great, thank you so much, Nick. That was terrific. I'll. Uh, there was one uh, question that's already popped up in the Q&A box. Um, it pertains to just kind of asking you to elaborate a little bit more on the meaning of water protector. Um, I'll, I'll just add also that your book, I thought for me, did a much better job than anything I had previously read and kind of getting at kind of the cultural, spiritual meanings of the, the phrase water is life than I had been reading like mm. in the news. Have you. So I really appreciate that aspect of the book and encourage people to check that out. But if you'd like to elaborate uh, on the meaning of water protector, that'd, that'd be terrific. Yeah, um, this kind of came out of uh, the the kind of demonization of quote unquote protesters, right? And um, there are some people who don't like the label of a protester because it, it actually uh, minimizes what they're trying to do. Um, and that they are like caretakers of the land, they're caretakers of the water, and that should be respected. And I totally, I one personally 100% agree with that position, but I also, you know, I'm also like, yeah, but I'm also a protester, and you can be both. They're not mutually exclusive, you know, because you can stand against injustice, and you should be proud to protest. Um, but that's something, you know, water protector is is something that anyone can be. And I think, um, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is a water protector because she was at Standing Rock. And the way it was told to me is that anybody who entered, who crossed that camp gate became a water protector just by default, by being there. You know, you stood with us, whether you're there for a day, whether there, you were there for like 10 days or several months, whether you donated online, whether you, you know, you um you supported in some way or you know you got in an argument with your family over dinner you know about, about it um it was a very it was something that everyone could like own and, and be and and be proud of and i think that's important and the second part of that question is mini choni which is like water is life and it doesn't it's, it's not it's not a, a neat translation there's an esoteric kind of understanding that water you know we say mini pashuta tokahe which is like water is our first medicine and it's not just like you know, we we're just sitting around and like, you know, being avatars like on um, Avatar the movie and plugging into the matrix or whatever. Um, but like that, that saying actually comes from um, Tomini, which is another name for the Black Hills, which actually means um, uterus. It means actually means her water is the translation. And so when we say mini wichoni, um, mini pejuta um, tokahe, water is our first medicine. It's like you, we were all born in water, right? Um, and we all require water to live. And that's what it means. It, it's not like water is the beginning of life for us, you know, in that sense. And so um, that's what, that's where that, that meaning it, it goes back. It's actually the second, um, it's, it's part of our creation story. It's the second, you know, um, Tunkashila or the second grandfather, so to speak. Um, and you know, it, while you can say like, you know, water is life in English, it doesn't have that same kind of connotation. And so when we say mini wuchoni, that's what we, that's what we're saying. Uh, but I do think that at the end of the day, that water is a fundamental human right. And that that should be the basis alone, you know, that we should say that like Flint deserves to have clean drinking water, period. You don't need to make another like you know, you don't need to extrapolate on that or make another justification. Native people deserve clean drinking water. Poor white people deserve clean drinking water, right? Everybody deserves clean drinking water. That should be the basis, fundamental human right. And so that's the other aspect where we say water is life as well. It's like, it's a, it's a, it's a universal. All right. Thanks. Thanks for that answer. We've had some other uh, questions pop up. Um, 
dovetailing with what you just commented on, one person asked if you have any comments on the concept of the rights of nature. Hmm. Yeah, I'm like, I, I know that the, that's going on throughout the world and, and um, and it's like good, you know, and I think it creates a critical conversation, but my, <laughs> I mean, I'm not trying to be like a Debbie Downer or trying to like be critical, but my question is, is always like, well, humans don't have equal rights under the law. And so what makes us think, you know, like for the longest time, indigenous people weren't even considered human, you know, black people weren't considered human. Many people of color and colonized people throughout the world were considered human and we still don't have equality under the law. So what makes us think that the law is something that can grant personhood um, to to nature. And while I, I, I'm sympathetic to it, and I do think it creates a critical conversation, um, we've passed the rights of nature in the state legislature here at, in New Mexico, but it has not stopped them from fracking. It has not stopped them from polluting our water. It has not stopped them from mining uranium. Um, and so I think like while it's like the move is important, there, there also has to be a critical understanding of like, um, the system itself. Great. Thank you for that. Another uh, question here is uh, if you can say more about work intersecting with uh, Palestine or Palestinians. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think this is, that is a really good question um, because, and it's not just with, Pal with Palestine and Palestinians. One of the things that I found really disturbing and also just very interesting when I was reading um, some of the released emails um, from these private security companies, uh, as well as the law enforcement um, that were operating um, the pipeline protests themselves is that they were, they were talking about Ferguson. They were talking about Baltimore. They were talking about the US Mexico border as well as Palestine all in the same breath while they were policing um, an indigenous led uprising in, in, in Standing Rock. And so it doesn't matter if I say it, like as somebody who's uh, a historian or somebody who's an activist or whatever, it doesn't matter if I say it because they're already making those connections. They're seeing these uprisings as related as part of a global counter, uh, a counterinsurgency project that they're a part of. They're looking to Palestine um, and seeing how Israel, Israel um, polices, its, uh, polices the Palestinian population. And they're looking at like how you know, um, the Ferguson uprising and like how local law enforcement policed um, black populations. Um, and the interesting thing, you know, the other fascinating thing about this is that you cannot deploy tear gas or pepper spray against um, a foreign nation or, or a nation of people who are considered sovereign, right? But yet Israel continually, continually uses chemical weapons such as tear gas and pepper spray against civilians in Palestine and so does the United States because we're not considered sovereign um, people. And so I think that's a really fascinating thing. It's actually a banned weapon of war that can still be used against civilian populations by their state. Um, yeah, and I mean, I, there's, there's more comparisons that one could draw, but I think um, just looking at the, the private security operations um, and the, the law enforcement and the way that they draw inspiration from um, policing black folks, policing um, Palestinians is very crystal clear. They understand with like, like to a T, they have training sessions about this. You know, they're not confused about the, the connections. So I think it's incumbent upon us as um, organizers to be really conscious of that and to incorporate it into the work that we do. All right. So we've got five minutes left. I'm going to try to wrap a couple of questions uh, that I've got together, and if you, you can give it give an answer to all of them in one sentence. But uh, so one question that I've got is kind of more on a practical level: What can congregations do to connect to uh, Standing Rock today, or to connect to more local indigenous struggles? Uh, and, you know, being not not present near Standing Rock. That's a question. And then another question is um, more thoughts on how sea colonization work can, uh, can take place across the country to protect water, land, and air. So, so just giving us some thoughts on, on, on what we can do to engage with the PR. I think like the first step is to look at the role 
of the church in 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 the colonization of the Americas. Um, like specifically for for example, like in where I'm from, some of the clergy that came out and colonized, uh, or that were part of the, the colonization process um, on our reservations were actually awarded land as part of, uh, personally, they were awarded land, and many of them donated it back to the church, and um, more so the Catholic church than um, kind of Protestant faiths, but nonetheless, I think that's an important aspect, but looking at like the, the thing such as the doctrine of discovery and understanding the ways that um, this papal bull has been incorporated and codified within U.S. law that essentially says Native people aren't humans. Um, and it's something that we've been working uh, uh, vehemently to, to get with, um, withdrawn. The third thing that you can do is to figure out whose land you're on and try to figure out what kind of relationship do you have with those people um, and how are you incorporating it into... Um, you know, how you're talking about being, you know, if you are, if you, one of the interesting things, and this is kind of tangential, but um, people, the, the word indio actually comes from, like some people say a Latin, like means in God, so indio, Indian, um, actually came from the colonizer seeing, you know, God in each of our potential converts essentially in us. But like, what is your relationship um, as a congregation to the original people of this land? and understanding that history, but also your current connection. What are you doing for it? And as far as decolonization, I think that's that's the most important step as well, is to think about that this isn't just an indigenous problem, that it's actually your problem as well. And I don't know a single indigenous organization that is turning away at alliances with the church uh, or with churches or with progressive churches. Um, that doesn't mean that we're looking for guidance, um, but we, you know, um, they're, you know, there's been a history of, of alliance with the church uh, of indigenous people of faith who have been working with the church um, or working, you know, in tandem to, to seek a, a common kind of um, goal of, of liberation because, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a question where decolonization involves native and non-native people. Um, it's not just um, our struggle. And so I encourage folks to, Think about it. Um, you can follow Caitlin Curtis on um, Twitter and social media. She she's an ind uh, indigenous person of faith who does a lot of work with churches and stuff. So I'd I'd recommend following her work. Um, and I can give you actually I can she has a reading list as well to help um, to help with folks. But she also has a book called Glory Happening and another one and I don't know what it's called, but it's coming out. So I would check. I would check out her work, um, and because she thinks through a lot of these things. Um, I'm trying to figure out her. Hold on one second. I have her stuff right here. Okay, so it's K A I T L I N, and it's Curtis C U R T I C E. Great. And someone uh, just posted in the chat box a link to, to her. Okay, I'll cool. I'll just quickly mention, you know, it's probably old news for a number of people joining us, but uh, a lot of denominations, uh, or, or a fair number of denominations, have materials on the Doctrine of Discovery. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll try to post a link to, to some of that uh, as well in the chat box. So now cool. to wrap the tradition of our call, is to uh, let Michael Malcolm uh, lead us into a call to action. So I'm going to turn things over to, to Michael. Thank you, Brooks. And uh, thank you, Dr. Nick. Uh, and Dr. Nick, I actually want to ask you a question, but um, let me frame it this way. Dr. King said, moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. And justice in anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an uh, inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow provincial outside agitator idea. Anyone who lives in the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its bounds. That being said, Nick, I, I know that there are those who are on this call who uh, don't necessarily live in proximity to you uh, in your organization, 
but what can we do to get involved and to help in, in this fight with your organization in particular? That's a really good question. Um, I wish we were bigger, <laughs> um, but we do have, we call the Native Liberation Conference happening in September 7th and the 8th, but we will also be, and that's in Gallup, New Mexico, you can find it on the website, but we will also be um, talking about a larger campaign to uh, fight back against these anti-protest legislations and it's not, they're gonna be happening in, in, you know, across the board in, in these states. And so um, wherever you are, you can, you can, you know, you can get involved in that, uh, but also, you know, all land is indigenous land in North America. And so you are connected um, by default, you know, if indigenous people are default and uh, political by default, then non-indigenous uh, non people <laughs> are political by default. Um, this isn't about um, individual kind of like choices, it's structural. And so we have to come at it that way as, as, um, as, as one people, um, as people who are united, as you know, in the tradition of King and, and many others. Um, yeah, I don't know, that's, that's the best I can offer right now. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's stay involved and stay informed. Don't just, you know, check out, um, you know, one day, I continue to read and continue to challenge yourself, you know, cause I can't, I can't stop being indigenous. It's something I live, you know, you ca I can't take off the skin and I can't take off, you know, the, the day to not be indigenous. <laughs> so. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, we do thank you again. And, um, one of the things that we want to ensure, and I did leave your, your information in the chat box, but we want to ensure that we cover, um, grassroots organizations, in particular as churches, uh, in, in that we help build capacity, that we volunteer our time uh, and our talent, but also we support in our treasure as well. Um, we find that grassroots organizations are often the ones that struggle uh, the most, but we do a great deal of the work when it comes down to the movement building and the resistance resistance building. So we want to make sure that we support. And that would be my call to action today, to mm -hmm. ensure that we support grassroots organizations and, and allow for them to lead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Nick, it has been wonderful to have you on here. We have fortunate enough that we've got a recording of it and so we will put it up on YouTube if that's okay with you sure. and just continue to get your message out there and to share it with as many people as possible. I'll send out an email uh, in that uh, to everyone who registered. I'll put a link to the YouTube uh, as soon as we're able to get that up and also we'll include some links to uh, uh, the organiz Nick's organization and, and some other links that have been shared here in the chat. So. Uh, please continue to stay engaged, and until next time, we'll we'll see you all later. All right. Take care. Thank you all. <laughs>